I think that it's the single greatest political unforced error I've ever seen. The man was elected basically to not be Donald Trump and to also be somewhat moderate. In 2022, is America the best place to be a conservative? Republicans are energized after a series of missteps from President Biden, from his chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan to the rising inflation crisis. As the Republican Party battles to find its ideological perspective after the Trump presidency, they enter into the midterms with fertile ground. To discuss the conservative movement in America, I'm joined by the author and podcast host, Ben Shapiro. What do you think is the greatest threat to American democracy today? There are a couple of threats that I think are truly frightening right now in the country. Threat number one is this belief that power is all that matters and who wields it or how it is wielded is not nearly as important as as the fact that it exists and must be wielded because the cause is just so great. Uh, and and that's, that's truly frightening. The willingness to m- essentially activate uh, anybody in any position in order to push forward a particular agenda that is, that is very anti-individual freedom, uh, very anti-individual choice, that, that is, that, that's a frightening thing. Uh, and then there is the, the general kind of polarization of society because we have such different views of what society should be. There used to be a belief in the United States that on a fundamental level, we all sort of wanted the same thing. We just had different ways of getting there. I'm, I'm not sure that that obtains anymore. And that's what you're seeing right now in this vast divide between, for example, the ethics of New York and the ethics of Florida or California and Texas. And at the federal level, that bodes really ill. It's fine. States can think differently if they want to. But at the federal level, if the federal government has all sorts of powers to pick one side or the other and then implement that top down via the administrative state or through a straight temporary majority in the House, for example, that's going to lead to an awful lot of conflict here. Are you surprised by Joe Biden's progressive agenda? I am. I mean, I think that it's the single greatest political unforced error I've ever seen. The man was elected basically to not be Donald Trump and to also be somewhat moderate. And people thought they were electing, effectively speaking, a a temporary corpse to, to just not be Trump and then give way to whatever came next. And that's what Biden campaigned as, right? He campaigned as the anti-Bernie Sanders. And then he got into office and it dawned on him that he had a majority in the Senate, although it isn't really a majority, it's a 50-50 split. And the only reason it's split 50-50 is because Trump foolishly intervened in Georgia and tossed two of those seats to the Democrats. So he had this, this extraordinarily fragile majority in the Senate, a very small majority in the House. And suddenly Joe Biden decided that the mandate for his presidency was not to restore normalcy or, or go back to some sense of, of decency or status quo ante. Instead, he was there to to be a transformational president. He started putting forward all these FDR, LBJ, Bernie Sanders-like plans. And that was always bound to fail. The American people weren't in favor of that. They really have not been in favor of that ever. Uh, and, and they certainly are not in favor of it right now, not with 50 seats in the Senate. Two of those seats shouldn't have even been in Democratic hands. He got another two seats in West Virginia and Arizona at a minimum that are not going to vote in favor of that sort of stuff. And Joe Biden pressed forward with it anyway. It's just, it's, it's asinine. It's political malpractice. How effective do you think he's been in implementing that agenda? How competent are they? I mean, they're, they're dramatically incompetent. That, that's the part that's truly insane to me. Now, the, the truth is that when it comes to spending proposals, Joe Biden could get probably 55, 60 percent of what he wanted simply by parceling it out and doing it individually. Right? Build Back Better is just a giant agglomeration of nonsense. But there's some stuff in there that's individually popular. And everybody acknowledges that if he did it on a bipartisan basis, he'd be able to get it done. I mean, he was able to get done a trillion dollar infrastructure bill. And he was able to do that with a certain amount of bipartisan support in, in the Senate. But he has decided that that's not how he wants to govern. That's the part that's that's really incredible. And then he's tried to cram it down via the administrative state. And that's been a failure in large measure as well, because it turns out the administrative state is still, thank God, bounded by the terms of the, the enabling acts that those administrative agencies were created under. And that means that you can't just do stuff because there is a, a four-letter acronym for a government agency that can do whatever it wants. To a British audience, it might surprise people that Joe Biden is historically unpopular and particularly his vice president can be put in an even more unpopular category. Uh, to British people, it's, that might be interesting because Do- Donald Trump was sort of painted to us as the most divisive and most radical president America has had in decades. How would you describe Joe Biden's presidency so far to British audiences? I think that everybody who has been watching would describe it as a disappointment. If you're a progressive, you're disappointed that he hasn't delivered on his promises. If you're a moderate, you're disappointed that Joe Biden swiveled dramatically away from moderation. And if you're anybody else, 
you are disappointed that Joe Biden didn't fulfill what his chief promise was. When he came into office, he said that he wanted to be a unifier. And this was his shtick. In his inaugural address, he talked about how we need to unite the country. We've been so divided. We've been so polarized. And I said at the time, that's a nice message, but it can mean two separate things. You can achieve unity by saying, you and I agree to disagree, but we are unified in certain sort of broad overarching goals, and we're going to agree to leave each other alone. That's one way to achieve unity. It's a friendly way of achieving unity. And then there is a much less friendly way of achieving unity, which is to purge your opponents and just run roughshod over them. And Joe Biden chose to do the latter. And I, I think that everybody on all sides is pretty disappointed in him. If you look at that, that latest Quinnipiac poll, which is the one everybody's citing because it has that a sort of shocking top line statistic that he has a 33% approval rating, which means seven in 10 Americans are not and not happy. Only 75% of Democrats are happy with Joe Biden's performance in that Quinnipiac poll. Among independents, his numbers are abysmal. His numbers are, are, in, the, are in the 20s among independents. Among Hispanic Americans, he's at 28%. I mean, these are bad, bad numbers. Lower in that Quinnipiac poll than Trump ever was, actually. And I think, again, the reason for that is People really hate having their expectations disappointed with Trump. People really didn't have any expectation that Trump was going to be a great unifier. That, that was never his pitch. Donald Trump was always Donald Trump. He remained Donald Trump, and then he wasn't president anymore, and he's still Donald Trump. He's, he's been Donald Trump the whole time. But Joe Biden has always played this sort of political game where sometimes he's incredibly divisive, like in 2012, when he suggested that Mitt Romney, who is the unsweetened oatmeal of American politics, wanted to re-enslave black people. And he said that in 2012. But then in 2016, 2020, he went back to being Grandpa Joe, the empathetic old elderly gentleman who's going to, he's going to help you through your grief. And then all of a sudden, he unmasked at the beginning of his presidency as a very partisan guy. And in the past several months, particularly, he's gotten incredibly and increasingly partisan. This week, he unleashed what was one of the most partisan broadsides I think anybody has seen in the modern era when he said that everybody who opposes getting rid of the filibuster and pushing forward a federalization of, of voting procedures was in league with Bull Connor and Jefferson Davis. I mean, these are, these are insane references. Even members of his own party were like, Joe, I don't know what you think you're doing here. Can you take us through some of his more radical statements? You mentioned that there. You talk about him wanting to purge his opponents. There's lots of talk within the Democratic Party of domestic terror threats from you know, extreme radical Trump voters and things like that. As you say, quite rightly, that isn't unifying language. That's very divisive language. So can you take us through, again, a British audience in, in mind, what he said that's so radical? Sure. So this week, just to start with the most recent, uh, he went to Georgia. And he spoke in front of a historically black church, and he suggested that anybody who did not want to kill the filibuster, which is a voting procedure in the United States in the Senate that requires essentially 60 votes in order to pass a bill of any major consequence, not a pure majority of 50 plus one, but 60 votes because you actually have to have uh, the ability to, to get it to the vote. So the filibuster has been a longtime feature of American politics. It goes back a couple of centuries. He said that we need to kill the filibuster in order to pass a bill that would essentially allow the federal government to oversee every aspect of voting in the United States. And if you, if you oppose this, he said that you had a choice between being on the side of Abraham Lincoln or Jefferson Davis, Jefferson Davis being the leader of the Confederate States of America, the pro-slavery side in the Civil War. He said you had a choice between being Martin Luther King and Bull Connor. Bull Connor, of course, the police chief who sicked dogs on black protesters at Selma in the 1960s against civil rights protesters. And he suggested that you had the choice to be in league essentially with segregationists or pro-slavery people or to be on the side of the angels and, and with Joe Biden. That's some pretty extraordinary language. He's been verging on that for months. So he's been saying for months that anybody who opposed him on his, his voting rights bill, so-called voting rights bill, was a, an emissary of Jim Crow. He said that a lot of the voting bills that are being promoted in places like Georgia were an attempt to disenfranchise black, pe black people en masse akin to the Jim Crow era 1960s regulation, 1950s regulations uh, that, that barred black people effectively from voting in many areas of the country. I mean, this is very, very charged language, and particularly in a country where race is so divisive, like the United States, using that sort of language from the presidential level, it, it's, it's far more divisive racially, actually, than anything that Trump officially said from the podium as president of the United States. It's worth pointing out these Voting Rights Act. So he's, he's saying that um, these, the legislation in Georgia and, and places like that, as you say, is sort of drink, Jim Crow 2.0. What do these acts actually do? For example, they ask for voter ID and things like that. Right. So, so the Georgia Act asks for voter ID. 
It actually expands early voting. So there's more early voting in Georgia than there is in, for example, New York State now. Uh, it, it gets rid of some of the drop boxes, like ballot drop boxes that, that existed in certain areas of Georgia. Uh, it, it says that you're not allowed to basically bribe people who are in line for voting by giving them free goodies while they while they are in line. Uh, it, it's It's kind of minor edge sort of stuff. There's nothing particularly shocking about the Georgia law that makes it any different from, say, Delaware state law with regard to voting, which is where Joe Biden is from. This was played as though this was an attempt to actively suppress the black vote. What happened in 2020 is there was this massive expansion of the way that voting was done. And the reason that was done is because of the pandemic. So there were a lot of people who were afraid that they were going to get infected if they went and stood in line to go vote uh, at the at the voting booth. And that turned out not to be true. It turned out that that was not a chief vector of transmission anywhere throughout 2020, but people were very afraid of that. And so there were a lot of states that said, for example, that we will send you an absentee ballot in the mail so that you can vote from home, even if you never requested an absentee ballot. Typically, if you wanted to vote absentee, you have to have some sort of excuse, or at least you have to make a request to vote absentee. A lot of states were like, well, you know, because of the pandemic, we'll just send you a ballot in the mail. And then we will allow parties to go out and essentially just pick up the ballots that they want to pick up, which seems kind of ripe for voter fraud and corruption. Uh, a, a lot of Democrats were very happy with these sorts of voting procedures. A lot of Republicans, not so much. So what the Democrats basically decided is that if any legislature across the country decided to go back to the prior status quo, right? The pandemic is, is now waning. You can go vote in person. You, you shouldn't get an absentee ballot unless you request one. If you do that, that's an attempt to now suppress the black vote. There is no statistical evidence of widespread voter suppression in the United States. Just as there is no statistical evidence of widespread election fraud in 2020, there is no statistical evidence of widespread voter suppression in the United States. In fact, there's less evidence of voter suppression in the United States than there is of voter fraud in the United States, and there's very little evidence of both. It is somewhat telling that the media in the United States have suggested that it is totally insane, out of the box for Donald Trump to suggest that the 2020 election was stolen on the basis of fraud. By the way, that's a contention with which I generally agree. I do not, I do not think that the 2020 election was decided on the basis of electoral fraud. I think there are all sorts of extraneous corrupt factors like the media's intervention and social media taking down posts and the the overt attempts by members of, of the Democratic Party to, to sort of change the, the tenor of the debate. Like All of this stuff, I think, is, is fair game. But I don't think voter fraud actually decided 2020. But Joe Biden is making a much more far-reaching contention. He is saying that every election from now until the end of time will be considered corrupt unless you allow me to pass this law because there's widespread voter suppression. That's a massive conspiracy theory, much bigger than one election was corrupt, that, which is what Trump was claiming wrongly. So this law basically allows the federal government to take control over the state's voting legislation. The states have to petition the federal government in order to change their voting laws, for example. Yes, there, there, there are some provisions that, that sort of do that. There's one that's called preclearance. Uh, so the, the Voting Rights Act of the 1960s uh, essentially allowed the federal government to have temporary power over certain states in the union when it came to how they redistricted, because there was a lot of fear that southern states were just going to minimize the power of the black vote by essentially changing the lines around particular districts to water down the black vote. And so for 40 years, the federal government oversaw redistricting in the southern states, and they had to pre-clear all the maps. And then about five, six years ago, the Supreme Court said it's been half a century since that happened. We're not seeing widespread evidence of an, of an attempt to suppress the black vote, so that no longer applies. This new law would try to put that back in place. The law would also, uh, the, the, the full-scale version of the law that Biden originally wanted, would have mandated the possibility of ballot harvesting across the country. I think this is the single most corrupt practice in American electoral politics. Ballot harvesting is a practice whereby everybody gets sent an absentee ballot, essentially, and then you have members of political parties, right? Somebody who works for the Republican Party, go door to door and pick up ballots, put them in his car and drive them over to the polling place. That seems like a, a just a mess. I mean, number one, it's a mess because then who votes kind of depends on how well-funded your, your party is, right? If you have a party with a lot of funding, then you can afford to send out a thousand people to go door to door and only pick out the registered Republicans and pick up the ballots or the registered Democrats and pick up the ballots. Second of all, if you're talking about people who have sort of an interest in punching a couple of extra holes in a ballot, party activists picking up ballots non-anonymously seems like a pretty bad way of doing things. To understand Biden's increasingly divisive rhetoric, should we be looking at his current policy failures? You mentioned he failed to pass the Build Back Better legislation, this great big uh, legislation that he was, he was really relying on, and also his failure to tackle the coronavirus pandemic. He famously said that he was going to shut down the virus, obviously more cases than ever before in the United States, more deaths under Joe Biden than under Donald Trump's tenure. Is this increasingly simply desperation from Joe Biden? I mean, I think so. I, again, I think that 
the, the, the question you asked earlier is really the telling one. Why are people so upset with Biden? And the answer, again, is disappointment. He made promises he knew at the time it was impossible to keep, but he has to keep maintaining the lie because otherwise he has undercut his entire presidency. So he made a couple of promises very specifically. One is that he was going to remake the entire economy along fairer lines. Right, well, the problem with that is when you say that, and then you say that your chief mechanism for doing that is spending oodles and oodles of money that we don't actually have, and then inflation increases, you have no way out of that. What are you going to say now? It was a bad idea? Right, your entire agenda was dependent on you spending more money than God or man had ever created before. And when that was basically kneecapped by a couple members of his own party in Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, he had no place to go. Then he made another promise, and this was the biggest promise. This promise was that the government had the power to shut down COVID. The, the government does not have the power to shut down COVID, as we've seen everywhere on Earth. Omicron particularly is extraordinarily, extraordinarily infectious. It's the most infectious thing I've ever seen in sort of my personal life. Every single person I know has Omicron. Thank God, it also happens to be extraordinarily less deadly than the Delta variant, according to the studies from Kaiser Permanente, up to 90% less deadly than the, than the Delta variant. So if Joe Biden had not said that government has the power to shut down the virus, he could see this as a blessing, right? He could say, listen, we've done all we can. We've provided the possibility of vaccination for all of you. You have the ability to go get yourself vaccinated. If you are vulnerable, if you are elderly, you 100% should. If you are not vulnerable and non-elderly, you should seriously consider it depending on your risk factors and, and depending on whether we're talking about Omicron or Delta, right? But otherwise, everybody should just go back to work. We're all going to live through this. It's going to be fine. The vast majority of people, and when I say vast majority, I mean nearly everyone who gets Omicron is going to have a mild bout and then is going to be totally fine. And then they'll have natural immunity thereafter. Also, the vaccines are not stopping transmission, so I can't really pledge to stop transmission. And so, you know, go about your daily business, go back to business, enjoy your life. He could have just done that, but he can't because he promised that he, in his personage, he was going to stop the virus. He literally tweeted this out. He said, I will not shut down the economy. I will not shut down the country. I will shut down the virus. Well, uh, no, you can't. And honestly, I don't blame Joe Biden for that because I don't blame any human being for an inability to shut down the virus because no human being can shut down the virus. I do blame Joe Biden for making a promise that was a lie. And frankly, I blame Americans for believing any, any, any politician who tells you they can solve all your problems is obviously lying to you. Um, one of the ways that he assumed that he could shut down the virus in his own words was to use vaccine mandates. Now, recently, the Supreme Court have overturned this mandate. Can you explain how your company was involved in that decision? Sure. So there was a, a vaccine mandate was put down by the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration here in the United States. That's an executive branch agency, so it works under the president of the United States. And the question was whether they have the authority to do what they did, because what they tried to do was say that any company with over 100 employees had to either get every employee vaxxed or they had to test them weekly. The, the employees would have to pay for their own tests. So they'd have to test weekly and completely mask or if they didn't do any of these things, these employees would have to be fired. And if you refuse to fire your employees who didn't want to vax and who also didn't want to test or mask, because let's say they had natural immunity, they had COVID last week. If they didn't want to do those things, you would have to fire them. If you didn't fire them, then OSHA would fine you $13,600 per instance that was accidental. And if they found that you were not firing them on purpose, or if you knew, that fine went up to $140,000 per instance. So the essential idea was they were just going to bankrupt you. And, and they would have bankrupted our company inside of a couple of weeks because- we have a lot of people at the company who are younger, who didn't feel the need to get the vaccination, who have had COVID two times at this point, because you know, they had Delta and then they got Omicron, or they had the original and then they got Omicron or whatever. Uh, and, uh, and so this was what the, the mandate was. Now, OSHA does not have that power. There's nothing in the OSHA enabling statute that gives them the power to simply say that 84 million workers in the United States must vaccinate it or, or face the possibility of firing. And that's what the Supreme Court found. The first day that this regulation was announced, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I have some constitutional background. We have lawyers who work for us. And I said, we're not complying with this. This is like until the Supreme Court decides that this is now the law, we are not going to comply. I'm not going to force my workers to go get vaccinated or risk firing. I, I think that's un-American. I think it's absurd. I think it's particularly absurd when everybody who's worried about this has the ability to get a vaccine right now and protect themselves. Now, if you have the ability to protect yourself, I don't see why it is your business what the person next to you is doing per se. Plus, if you're really worried, you could vaccinate and you could wear an N95. We weren't stopping anybody from asking. So we challenged this literally the, the minute that this regulation was released. We put out a challenge in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, we were one of many companies that ended up doing so. We, I think we we're the first, but we ended up being uh, agglomerated together with a bunch of other plaintiffs in this Supreme Court case. And the Supreme Court just struck down the OSHA mandate saying that it exceeded the authority of the Occupational Health and Safety Administration. Because as you would imagine, 
the the basic idea that a a small agency, which is designed to, say, get rid of asbestos in the workplace, can force 84 million people to vaccinate. That's a stretch. The court basically said if Congress wants to do it, Congress can talk about it, but you ain't Congress. I want to talk more about the divisive nature of American politics. When uh, Donald Trump was president in the UK, there were so many opinion pieces saying we should be very concerned about American politics, American democracy, because Donald Trump is going to destroy it. And as we've mentioned, Joe Biden has made you know, his rhetoric is extreme and divisive, but also his actions, the mandates, uh, packing the Supreme Court, talking about uh, ending the filibuster. These are all things that Democrats have talked about and want to do. Uh, so should we, in Britain, should we be concerned about American democracy? Should we be concerned about the, devi the divisive nature in particular of your politics at the moment? I mean, yes. <laughs> I think that the divisive nature of American politics is, is certainly troubling. I think it's mostly troubling at the federal level. So one of the, the encouraging signs that I've been seeing, and not just seeing, you know, enacting in my own daily life, uh, is that what, what we've been calling the big sort, which is this, this movement of populations. There's been an enormous population movement over the last several years. It has accelerated radically since the advent of COVID. A lot of people who are kind of Republicans in blue states have been moving to Republican states. The, what you've been seeing is a huge drain from places like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, down to Florida, for example. Now, you've seen a huge drain from California to Arizona and Texas, right? and, and that is accelerating. So red states seem to be getting redder and blue states seem to be getting bluer because when the red people leave, they leave uh, you know, less uh, red people there to, to vote against the, the Democrats. So California is going wildly to the left and Florida is moving to the right. I don't think it's a bad thing, right? Under the federalist structure, the idea is these states basically get to do what they want to do and the federal government should have very little say about it. What does scare me is this is the the attempt top down from from Joe Biden to to cudgel all those red states into doing the things that he wants with the power of the federal government? That's a real problem to me because you can live fairly happily with a, a skeletal federal government doing very few things except providing for the national defense and allowing the states to do kind of what they want. That was in fact the original structure under the Constitution. What is scary is when the federal government is the biggest factor in Americans' lives and it starts running roughshod over the states because then it's just a question of who controls the federal government and who gets to cudgel whom. And that, that's when politics gets to be a sort of fever pitch. It's, it's almost reminiscent of, of in, in the UK, the battle over the EU. Does the EU get to control every area of your life? Did you give them this sort of permission or should you in the UK be able to live differently than folks who are living in, say, Italy? Now, you've described perfectly the argument some Republicans use for a secessionist movement where red states would separate from the United States of America. They also say that every single major institution in America is run by sort of woke activists or Democrats who do not believe in the fundamental concept or values of the United States. And therefore, as I said, there should be a new country where Florida and other states uh, secede. Do you think there is any, uh, anything persuading in that argument? Um, well, I think it's, it's, it's impractical is what I would say. The reason I say it's impractical is because all the people who have advocated for, for example, a national divorce, I have a lot of sympathy for the idea that Florida has to be Florida. And if the federal government is going to start imposing its will on Florida, that's a real problem. I just don't see the practical application of the, of the notion that the federal government is suddenly going to dissolve and a nuclear armed force of 2 million people that is funded with trillions of dollars a year is suddenly going to go away or that it's going to allow for this sort of uh, nice amicable divorce. I just don't see how, how that is effectuated in any real way. And, and nor do I think that it should be necessary, right? The question is, are we speaking descriptively or normatively? Are we talking about something we think is going to happen? Or are we talking about something that, that quote unquote should happen? Because if we're talking about something that should happen, the thing that really should happen is that California and Florida should remain a country, but also the federal government should not force California to live like Florida or Florida to live like California. Right? That, that would be the, the actual normative solution. It would be to have the federal government do the very specified things that are described in the Constitution of the United States, limited and enumerated powers, and leave everyone the hell alone. Right? That would be the, the job of the federal government, and then you could still have a country. If we're talking descriptively, is the country going to fall apart? Now, well, it's certainly not going to fall apart along the lines of half the country just goes its own way. I just as, as a descriptive matter, I don't see how you get from point A to point B right there. That, that's not to say that I don't understand uh, the the sort of philosophical leanings of people who are saying, I don't see what we have in common with California anymore. As somebody who just escaped California for Florida, I can say that I think that the values of California are extraordinarily different from Florida and growing more uh, more different every single day. And that that is uh, that is troubling. Um, but again, as as the idea that this is like a, a practical solution, uh, or is this sort of just sort of a historical inevitability argument? I've heard that too. 
that, that historically, inevitably, you know, empires decline, countries fall apart, and maybe that will happen in the future. Okay, well, it, that, that's a different argument than it's going to happen today or it should happen today. And if it, if it is going to or should happen today, I actually need a plan, not just a, a lamentation that California and Florida have different values, which, of course, I agree with. I suppose Republicans, some Republicans would argue that this issue of the federal government wanting to impose their will upon the states isn't going away anytime soon. As long as you've got the Democrats in power and waiting to be in power, then uh, this is what they will attempt to do. Therefore, uh, it's actually beneficial to start talking about it's time for a national divorce. Do you see uh, any reasoning within that argument? Um, I mean, I think that it's time to talk about strengthening the states. Again, when, when you get to the point of, quote unquote, national divorce, I want to see a plan. Like, well, what does that look like? Nobody ever seems to get into the what does that look like aspect of this. Does that mean that you just stop paying taxes to the federal government? And what do you think the results of that are? Does that mean that if the federal government deploys soldiers, that, well, that there's armed conflict? Like, well, what does this actually look like? Because it sounds, a lot, uh, it sounds a lot easier than I think it actually is in practicality. Again, that's not to disparage the underlying diagnosis, which is that as a country, we seem to be going in very, very different directions and clinging to a federal government as the unifying force is a huge mistake. I agree with that. I don't think the federal government should be the unifying force. I don't think the federal government should do much of anything is the truth. Um, but I, I think the solution for that is, you know, if, if a conservative is elected president again in 2024, then the job of that, of that conservative is to throw up systemic barriers to the power of the federal government, meaning the federal government needs to be drawn and quartered, essentially. The federal government is a behemoth. It is a behemoth with the inordinate power to force people within states to live how it wants them to live. And the big mistake of the Trump administration is that he didn't go too far in, in destroying the administrative tyranny. That, that has the potential to, to overrun the country. I mean, one of the things that I noticed about the, the vax mandate case at the Supreme Court level is the dissent. So that, that case was 6-3. And the, the justices on the majority side said, OSHA does not have the power to do this. The justices on the minority side in the dissent, they said basically these administrative agencies can do whatever they want so long as they declare an emergency. If there's an emergency, you can do whatever you want. And it does not even matter. Really, if you are given the power by Congress to do this, you should be able to do whatever you want Unelected bureaucrats should do it, and we should not get in the way. I mean, that's really, truly scary stuff. You know, what, the, the last thing that I want to see in the United States is open violence. Right? That's the worst possible outcome here. Uh, and so if you're going to describe a solution, that solution theoretically uh, should avoid violence. Uh, it should eschew violence. Uh, and it should end with an understanding as to the nature of, of the country right now, which is that, again, New York and California are not Texas and Florida. Do you believe there is a danger that America is heading towards more political violence? Uh, I think it would be shocking if America didn't head toward some more political violence. Again, I think that when you have everybody on all sides suggesting that every election uh, is a referendum on the system itself, that's a, that's a real problem. Right? The, the, the reason that people stay a part of any political system is if they believe, one, their voice is being heard, and two, the, the benefits to staying part of the political system outweigh the costs of leaving the political system. And right now, both of those things are falling into question, right? A lot of people are feeling like their voices are not being heard. That's being whipped up by politicians on all sides, whether you're talking about Trump circa 2020 or whether you're talking about Biden right now saying that every election across the country is rife with voter suppression. That sort of conspiratorial thinking on elections means people believe their voices are not mattering, they're not being heard. Uh, and then on the, on the secondary question as to you know, whether you feel like the benefits outweigh the costs of staying as part of the system. If you feel like all of the powers that be are targeting you and your family, it becomes you know, much more easy to say, well, actually, if I could leave the system, I would leave the system. And that, both of those together, that, that raises the possibility of, of, actual, of actual violent behavior. So this heightened rhetoric, is it sort of sowing the seeds towards a civil war type scenario? Uh, I think that the possibility of like a full-blown civil war with Americans fighting each other in the streets is still low. I think really, really low. I just don't think that Americans are prepped for anything like this. I think there's a lot of loose talk about it. But the reality is that most of the people who talk about this kind of stuff are either very blue people living in very blue areas or very red people living in very red areas. If you're living in a purple area, you're not really talking about this with your neighbor. If you if you if you're living in a if you if you're living in a blue area. You know, that where, where Antifa is popular, you're living in Portland and you're talking about, we're going to have a bloody war with the people down. You don't know anybody down in Texas. And if you're down in Texas and you're talking about, well, I'm going to fight a battle with the people up in Brooklyn, like the people up in Brooklyn are in Brooklyn. So I, I think that the, the possibility of this coming down to, you know, actual street violence, people in mass numbers, in mass, I, I think that remains pretty low. That doesn't mean that you're not going to see more and more regularization of violent, spontaneous activity over time. 
Because again, when you raise the temperature on the pot, every so often the pot's going to boil over. That doesn't mean it's a continuous state of boiling. It doesn't mean the pot's going to explode irrevocably. It does mean you can't keep raising the temperature on the stove and then expect the pot not to bubble. One of your solutions to the many problems America faces was to break up the federal government to prevent it overreaching and implicating uh, the states, state rights, for example. Do you think that there is any role for the federal government or even for state governments to fight back against woke culture. So there's this debate on the right where you've got libertarians saying the market should decide what's going on here. And there are some conservatives who say, well, actually, no, we should be using the tools of the government to fight this culture war. Where do you sit on that? So my, my answer on this really does rely on level of government. So I don't think that the federal government has a tremendous role in, in fighting woke them on a First Amendment level, right? There is, a, there is a constitution. The constitution says the Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. However, that does not mean that the Department of Education should be subsidizing wokeness. And any law that says that the Department of Education cannot subsidize wokeness makes sense to me because the, the government does get to decide certain messages that it promulgates and it should not be promulgating those messages. We should not be teaching this crap to, to people in the Navy, right? This is, that, that's very silly. When it comes to the local level, Local school boards should be able to decide what kids learn. I mean, that's the purpose of having a local school board. That, that is not a violation of freedom of speech. Nobody has ever suggested there's complete freedom of speech in a third grade classroom. Anybody who has suggested that is an idiot. So the, the, the basic notion that parents get to vote for school board members who then decide what gets taught makes a lot of sense to me. States have tremendous amounts of plenary, they have plenary power in, in a lot of these areas. And I don't think that it is a, a violation of core liberty for the state to say, we are not going to subsidize or teach children that, for example, America is indubitably and indelibly racist and can never be fixed. That seems to me a core function of an educational system in any government. If you're, if you're teaching the kids who go to government schools that the entire system is corrupt and evil, how is that remotely in the interest of either taxpayers or the government itself? Now, this issue of school boards is fascinating to me. It seems to me that this has been one of the great successes of the modern 2020s Republican Party, where you've actually been able to fight back against this terrible ideology being taught in schools on a grassroots level. And to many Americans, they may be quite depressed about their country at the moment. They may see that every single institution has been taken over by these radical Democrats, et cetera, et cetera. But in Britain, I think we've got similar issues, but there is much more hope in America for conservatives. Do you think there is anything that British people and British conservatives in particular can learn from how Republicans are fighting this culture war? So number one, Republicans have now embraced the culture war, which is something they should have done all along. Uh, there was this sort of going theory among some of the intelligentsia on the right. Never n leave the culture world alone. It's not about the culture wars, guys. It's about economic growth and tax rates and all. Listen, I love economic growth as much as the next guy, uh, and I am a full-fledged capitalist in every aspect of, of the word. However, however, the culture war issues matter an awful lot, and this is particularly true for those of us who have kids. If you have kids, then the, the cultural milieu in which your kids grow up matters an extraordinary amount to you. And Abandoning those culture wars means abandoning all of the rest because the left agenda comes of a piece. Okay, the, the socialism that the left is, is frequently pushing in terms of economics, or at least the redistributionism that they're constantly pushing in terms of economics, that is not philosophically and ideologically separated from the culture wars that they are fighting to obliterate all traditional roles in society. And so the, the attempt by parents particularly to take back their power over raising their kids, is, is, it's a major issue in the United States. And it's also the rise of a new interest group. You know, before the left decided to go completely insane. And I really mean this. The left has lost their mind as far as what they think they can get Americans to go along with. Before that happened, there was a basic idea, which is that parents were not an interest group. Parents were just parents. And you had kids, that's it. Now that the left has basically decided, as Terry McAuliffe said in the Virginia governor's race, that parents should have no role in deciding what their kids learn. And when you have kids being taught at the age of six in places like California, LGBTQ history, and when you have gender theory being taught to small children, kids who are five, six years old being taught that they can switch their genders, when you have people being taught at the age of seven that racial essentialism is a thing and that you are, you are certainly a beneficiary of white privilege if you are white in the United States and that you ought to think of yourself predominantly as a person of race in the United States, when that sort of stuff is, is pushed by the left, you're going to see parents who are not right wing starting to say, I did not sign up for any of this. All I wanted was, was you know, slightly more government health care coverage. <laughs> I did not sign up for, you get to indoctrinate my kids in the Howard Zinnification of American history or the Ibram X. Kendiization of American race talk. If Republicans do win the midterm elections and then go on to win 
the presidency in 2024, should they attempt to fight the culture war with the aim of defeating the enemy? And that is a quote from Sohrab Armari, an American journalist who believes that it's more important to uh, go out and fight the culture wars than, I suppose, unite the country. Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't think that you can unite the country without actually defeating the opponent. Uh, I won't say enemy because enemy sometimes has violent connotations, but, but without defeating the opponent uh, in, uh, in, in these culture wars. I will say enemy if you're trying to hijack the education of my kids. I think that's probably what Saurabh's talking about right there. Uh, you, 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 how can you have unity with people who want to teach my seven-year-old daughter that she can be a boy? I can't have unity with you if that's your goal. You're literally saying that you ought to raise my child. So no, no unity, victory. <laughs> If Republicans do win those elections, is there any chance or, or how can they at least attempt to try and bring Democrats back into the fold? How do they try and unite some of the uh, massive divisions in America? So, I mean, again, I think that one of the big things that Republicans should be pursuing is is the complete defunding of massive institutions of the federal government and revisiting how much power the federal government has. So maybe you can get some Democrats to sign on to the possibility of more authority devolving to the state level because they seem a lot more friendly to federalism when a Republican is president than when a Democrat is. Uh, so I, I think the idea of saying to Democrats, listen, guys, you don't like the president? That's okay, you don't have to like the president. But do you really want him running your life from the federal government? What if we just make an agreement that the federal government is going to put itself out of business? Right? Like th that seems to me like that could have the potential for, for some victory there. There's some, there are some bipartisan issues in the United States. I don't make it sound like we're, we're all on different sides of every issue. I don't think that's true. So for example, I, I know for a fact there's wide bipartisan consensus that China is an emerging threat and that China needs to be fought. Uh, I don't mean militarily, but China needs to be stymied. And that probably means significant sanctions on China. It means retooling how our economy is reliant on Chinese goods and services for security purposes. It seems like there's wide bipartisan support for something like that. Uh, I think a parent's bill of rights is something that, that there are going to be a lot of Democrats who support. And if they don't, they're going to lose elections because that is a major issue. So th there are some areas of crossover for sure. One of Donald Trump's biggest failures in the eyes of many Republicans was his failure to tackle these uh, elite institutions which have been captured by uh, the Democrats and by woke ideologues. So, for example, uh, the FBI or big tech or big businesses or universities, or you can take your pick. All of these institutions seem to have been captured by these very, very radical activists. How do you think the Republicans should tackle this in the future? What do you think is the solution to all of these uh, institutions which have been captured? So again, it sort of depends on what level of abstraction you're talking about. At the local level, you can do some of this with legislation. At the state level, too. The federal government, obviously, I think there are a lot more boundaries on what the federal government can and, and should do just because the United States is an extraordinarily diverse place. Uh, what that means, however, is that there, there are certain areas, like, for example, the, the FBI, where the president of the United States probably should have cleaned house at a lot of the top levels of the FBI. Uh, I think the State Department should basically be cleaned top to bottom. I think that there's a case to be made that the president of the United States, the next one who comes in, ought to come in and completely disband full departments. I mean, the, some of these departments are just ensconced, uh, as, as Ronald Reagan once suggested. Uh, the only way to guarantee everlasting life is to, is to go to work for, an ever, is to work for a government agency. And these things never die and they only grow. Uh, so the, the, the elimination of, of these full administrative states, uh, I think would be a, a very good thing. You know, when, when Trump talked about the deep state, I think that you know, th there is a, a dark and conspiratorial way of reading that, which is there's a bunch of people who sit in a back room somewhere and they conspiratorially figure out how to run the world. And then there's the sort of more generic way of reading that, which is there are a bunch of career employees at a bunch of administrative agencies who generally agree on politics and then try to implement that stuff. And I think that latter description is true. And the answer to that is you fire a lot of those people. Now, if a Republican or a conservative listened to that answer 20, 30 years ago, they may have been surprised. They may argue that the role of a conservative is to protect our institutions and is to conserve what is important in America, which again is those part of those major institutions. What would you say to that argument that actually you should be attempting to protect those things that are, that are core and valuable to the American state? I mean, I agree. I just don't think the administrative state is core and valuable to the American state. You know, it's the, it was the progressive movement that initiated the, the administrative state as a general part of American public life. The founders certainly never envisioned it this way. So. The, the, the notion that if I dismantle the Department of Education, that's somehow anti-conservative uh, is, is sort of a bizarre argument. Um, the, yeah, when, when it comes to the FBI, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be an FBI. I'm saying that it requires significantly more oversight given the facts that we now see about how the place runs. 
uh, and that that oversight ought to have real consequences for people who fail. I mean, if people fail, they should lose their jobs and they should not work there anymore. With great power comes great accountability, not just responsibility, accountability. But right now we have great power and no accountability. I suppose breaking up the federal state is a slightly easier question, for conservatives at least, than when it comes to private companies like Twitter and big tech companies. What would be your approach to those companies who again hold so much power, some argue they are monopolies or at least oligopolies, uh, and they are, are censoring people and there's lots of problems for conservatives there? So to, to me, the, the question there, in, so in a vacuum, I'm a libertarian on this sort of stuff. And I say in a vacuum, advisedly. So I'm a libertarian in the sense that I think that companies get to do kind of what they want so long as they're not stepping on anybody else's toes. When it comes to the social media companies, the problem is uh, that we do not operate in a vacuum. These social media companies have been cudgeled, they've been beat around by government actors. I mean, Dianne Feinstein literally called Mark Zuckerberg, the head of Facebook, on the carpet and said, if you don't start shutting down content, we will regulate you. Okay, when you are operating under that sort of threat, you are no longer an independent actor in a free market of ideas. You are now operating under the, under the knowledge, the certain knowledge, that if you cross certain political actors, they will break you. And once that happens, then you have to start taking some pretty significant looks at if it's even possible to have a free marketplace of ideas under those circumstances. <clears throat> when you have government agents that are deciding you know, whether Facebook even gets to operate, then that's a, that's a real problem. And so what I've suggested, for example, this is something that the, the Republicans in the Senate I took up, I believe, last session, and was a revision to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Section 230 was designed to originally allow for the possibility of more speech on the internet. So basically, the way that it worked is that it, I'm a publisher, right? I, I do da I'm a publisher of Daily Wire. I'm editor emeritus of, uh, of Daily Wire. And that means that if something gets printed on our site and it is slanderous or libelous, uh, then we can be sued. Right? Just like the Telegraph can be sued if you guys print something slanderous or libelous. Uh, in, in, that does not apply to our comment section. Okay, so the reason it doesn't apply to our comment section is because there actually was a case in the early 1990s in which there was a comment section. The publication was curating the contents of the comment section. They were taking down pornographic posts and advertising and stuff. And somebody sued them and said, you're now a publisher. That means that you are acting basically like the UK Telegraph or like Daily Wire. You're censoring content. That means that you're editorial input is deciding what people can see and can't see, so you are therefore responsible for everything you don't take down. Okay, that argument was, was vitiated by Section 230, which was designed to say you can take down pornography, you can take down advertising, you can clean the comment sections without removing the, the image of you as sort of not responsible for the stuff that's posted. And just like the phone company is not responsible for the stuff you say on the phone line, Facebook is not responsible for whatever post you put up today. Well, the problem is over the past several years, this has been used in reverse. So this was meant to allow Facebook and other companies to arise and thrive while allowing more content. And they could take down kind of the dirty stuff and they could take down the stuff that nobody likes and all that, but they, they weren't really allowed. They weren't supposed to anyway, use this as a tool for, for idea suppression. And that was the precise opposite of what Section 230 was designed to do. Well, Section 230 instead became a tool for governmental actors who then said, okay, well, here's the deal. You guys under Section 230, you're not responsible you're not held liable for anything on your platform and you can remove material that's pornographic and you can remove material that is advertising and anything otherwise objectionable. There's a catch-all provision in 230. It says you can remove anything otherwise objectionable. That catch-all provision then allows people like Dianne Feinstein to say to Mark Zuckerberg, if you don't remove the stuff I find objectionable, this means that I am going to hold you liable for the stuff that you leave up. That's super dangerous. What they really should do is they should just get rid of the otherwise objectionable language in Section 230. Now Facebook can remove anything that it is, that, that's, that's specifically designed to be removed. So advertising, spam, you know, openly abusive behavior. And I mean like direct insults, not just saying that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. Uh, and anything else, you're not covered. If you start taking down that material, we're going to treat you just like we would treat the Telegraph or the, or the Daily Mail or the, or the Daily Wire. And, and you're going to be held responsible for the content that others post because if you're sitting there on top of people, figuring out what can be posted and what cannot on the basis of your own editorial judgment, you do not differ in kind from any of these other publications. Now, you've been watching American politics for a fair while now. Uh, you've seen the transformation of the Republican Party. The Republican Party of 2012 is almost a completely different beast to the Republican Party of 2022. Do you feel that the party has now been converted fully to Trumpism? Well, I don't think Trumpism is an ideology. So I think that it, it, Trumpism is more an attitude than anything else. 
And if by Trumpism, we mean you know more combative, absolutely. It's a much more combative party than it was in 2012. And I think that it was bound to be a more combative party than 2012 because the big takeaway in 2012 for many Republicans was we ran the nicest human being who maybe ever has walked the earth, as I called him before, the unsweetened oatmeal of American politics, Mitt Romney. We ran that guy. And then the Democrats called him a racist, including Joe Biden. They called him a racist, and then he lost. And so we're not doing that anymore. We're going to run people who are militant and people who are passionate and people who are going to stand up against the media and clock them when need be. So I think that transformation is done. I think that that is is a reality in American public life. You know, I, I think that there can be limits put on that, you know, in the sense that I do think that there is a distinction between being combative when there is a purpose and then just being a jackass. I don't think those are quite the same thing. Uh, and I think that that distinction is important. I think some people have trouble drawing that distinction, you know, on all sides of the aisle. Um, but uh, I, I sometimes, have, you know, everyone, I think, has trouble drawing that distinction, but some worse than others. Uh, yeah, that, that, that combativeness is not going away. And in many ways, I don't think that it should go away because combativeness in politics has always been a thing. Uh, it's just that we we sometimes pretend that it isn't. Uh, as far as sort of the policy preferences, I think there are certain certain cans of worms have, have sort of been reopened. I wouldn't say that that one side or the other has won them yet. So, for example, on trade, there's been a lot of talk about Trump being you know less friendly toward free trade. I don't think that that's a core issue for a huge majority of Americans. I don't think Trump won because he was in favor of certain tariffs. I think Trump won because he was Trump, because he had a certain personality and he was running against a very unpopular candidate in 2016 in Hillary Clinton. And that's also why he lost in 2020, because he was a very particular kind of personality and some people didn't like him, right? So, so I think that, that, that it's that simple. So I, I, whenever people try to boil down Trumpism to a philosophical bent, I don't particularly think that's right. I think it's, it's a, if it means anything, it just means challenging taboos. And some of those taboos, frankly, I think needed to be challenged. And some of those taboos, I think, don't need to be challenged. But those are mostly open debates inside the Republican Party. Trump's legacy, when it comes to transforming the party, maybe just reopening the possibility for debate in certain of these areas. Listen, in certain of those areas, I, I think that Trump is wrong. In certain of those areas, I think Trump is right. And I think those debates are generally worth having. Well, this is the interesting thing, isn't it, where you look at these debates over free trade, for example, but also the neoconservatives, they seem to have lost in a big way. Uh, Trump's policies were far less hawkish than George W. Bush, for example. Uh, you know, He was very supportive of this idea of pulling out of Afghanistan, perhaps in a different way to President Biden. And there are other debates, as you mentioned rightly, that are really uh, hot in the Republican Party right now. And I think you're being slightly unfair to Trump when, he, when, you, when you talk about the tariffs, because he did make this argument that we need to bring back manufacturing jobs to the Rust Belt. There was this huge issue of economic stagnation within sort of middle and working class America that had been due to globalization and other trends that every single political elite had supported. So surely there is some argument that Trump has changed the economics as well as the style of the Republican Party to a more, as you say, sort of protectionist uh, viewpoint. Yeah, I, I won't say that he's done that overall, but I do think he's reopened that debate. I mean, that, that, that's what I was saying before. I, I don't think that he has converted the entire Republican Party to be pro-tariff, um, but I certainly think that that is a, a more live question inside the Republican Party than it was, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Now, the, the irony, of course, is that Trump actually was a pretty pro-free trade president. The, the number of actual hardcore tariffs that he, that he put in place were a lot more limited than the sorts of things that he said he was going to do, right? NAFTA 2.0 was basically kind of like NAFTA 1.0, but slightly better for the United States. Right? There, there, there are certain, he signed free trade agreements with, with a lot of Southeast Asian countries, right? There, there, there's like a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that Trump, what Trump said and then what the administration did were very often two separate things. Afghanistan's a perfect example of this. Trump kept saying, we're going to pull out, we're going to pull out, we're going to pull out. And then his secretary of state was signing agreements that basically said, if you don't hit this mark and this mark and this mark, we're not pulling out. And the Taliban didn't hit those marks. So it was, you know, th- th- there was a lot of sort of what Americans were hearing from Trump. And then there's what the administration w- was doing. Those weren't always quite the same thing. As in, I may be too cynical about politics. I-, I just don't think people focus on policy all that much until it directly affects them. Now, as a almost lifelong conservative, now you can correct me on that. I'm not sure when you sort of adopted that. Oh, no, I- lifelong. No, I think okay, probably fantastic. prenatally. Yeah. All right, perfect. So you, you're uh, you're a lifelong conservative, and you've been watching these since 2016. This huge eruption in American politics, and in the UK we had a similar thing with Brexit, of course. And you've seen these huge transformations in the Republican Party from the very nice party with Mitt Romney to the slightly nastier but perhaps more honest party with Donald Trump. Do you are you more are you personally more excited about? politics. Do you think that this is the best time to be an American conservative in 2022? 
I mean, right now, I'm very excited about being conservative. I think Republicans are going to have a great year in 2022. I think that we have a lot of great candidates who are coming up in, in 2024. Uh, listen, I, th- I think that the the possibility of blowback, which you know seemed very distant even a year ago, is now extraordinarily real. Because, well, as always, if you can't count on your own party to be smart, you can at least count on the other party to be unbelievably stupid. This seems to apply across the board, uh, no matter which party you are talking about. Uh, and, and that's certainly the case with Joe Biden and the modern Democratic Party. All they had to do was not be crazy, and they just couldn't do it. It's funny you say that because much of this interview has been so depressing. We've been talking about political violence and all these terrible things. Yet at the same time, to be a conservative in America is an optimistic uh, place to be. For sure. I mean, because I, I think that the excesses of the left have been made absolutely clear in policy. I've never seen, by the way, the effects of policy take place so quickly as they have in the past couple of years. It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, the murder rates in every major blue city in America skyrocketed over the course of the last two years. That is a direct impact of the Democratic Party saying police are systemically racist and perhaps we should think about cutting their funding. Right? That, that has an immediate impact, like immediate. Right? Crime rates rising all over the place, violent crime rates rising in major cities, homelessness exploding in places like California. The, the tremendous inflation that Joe Biden, like people thought inflation was not a real thing anymore. This was a going economic theory. Modern monetary theory was a going economic theory until 30 seconds ago. It was Elizabeth Warren was pushing it forward. The idea could spend endlessly with no consequences whatsoever. And then you get a massive out of control inflationary spiral because Joe Biden is spending too much money. You know, the I, I've never seen reality hit an agenda quite as fast as I've seen reality hit Joe Biden's agenda. And so I think that has, has been sort of, it, it almost makes you giddy because typically politics, one of the things that's complicated about politics is you'll, you'll create a policy It'll take five years for it to implement and another five years for it to be fully felt. And then you'll say, oh man, I can see how point A led to point B led to point C. And then someone will say, no, 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 it wasn't that at all. It wasn't that, that you spent $22 trillion in the war on poverty or whatever it was. It, w- it wasn't any of that. It was that it was that there were intervening factors here. And it's very difficult to make that argument over the course of the last several years when it seems like all of time has sped up and you can see almost like M. Night Shyamalan's old, right? You can see immediately, I do X and Y happens, like right upon it. And so I think a lot of Americans are getting an object lesson. It feels like the 70s this way. Like, there are a lot of Americans right now who are being mugged by reality, Joe Biden predominantly. Let's talk about 2024. I'm going to give you three names. And after I say the name, I want you to respond. Donald Trump. I think he's going to run. Uh, I'd, I'd be shocked if he doesn't run. Uh, and uh, that is a risky bet for Republicans. That is a, that is a, a very fraught election for the country. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of many of the things that Donald Trump did as president of the United States. Uh, I think that he and the country would best be served by him uh, becoming a, a sort of kingmaker in the Republican Party rather than the candidate again. But I don't think that uh, my voice, let alone anyone else's, weighs very much with, uh, with a guy who uh, doesn't tend to listen to outside advice all that often, sometimes to his credit, sometimes to his detriment. Hillary Clinton. Uh, I don't think it's over for Hillary. I, I know that this has become kind of the, the hot theory of that. I, I don't think this is totally wrong. I mean, we, we, the, a prerequisite for presidency of the United States apparently now is that you must have run at least several times before and also be 197 years old. Hillary Clinton hits both of those marks. So uh, I see if Joe Biden were to be too unhealthy to run, they can't let Kamala Harris do it. I mean, they just can't. She's the worst politician in the history of American politics. She makes Hillary Clinton look like the model of sincerity and authenticity. I mean, my God. So, so Hillary, you put Hillary next to Biden, she looks more alive. You put Hillary next to Kamala Harris, she looks like not Joaquin Phoenix's joker. So, you know, compared to some of the other, can- like who else is out there? Pete Buttigieg, whose chief claim to fame is that he is a gay secretary of transportation who took a two month vacation in the middle of a supply chain crisis. Like <laughs> not, not a lot of options on that bench over there. And finally, Ben Shapiro. Um, are we taught for, for what? <laughs> are you going to run? This is what people have been asking. No. Why would I possibly run? No. I have a young family. I'm, you know, 38 years old. Like, no, that, no, that's, I, I, how about this? Come back to me in five decades when I'm the average age of our presidential candidates and then we'll talk. Can we talk about some of the other Republican candidates that could be in place of Donald Trump? So Ron DeSantis is a name that seems to be cropping up. Nikki Haley is another one. Now, these people seem to be on opposite sides of the sort of Trump debate. What, 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 can you sort of assess the, the greatest Republican leaders who could, who could run in 2024? Well, Ron's a stud. I mean, the, the, I, I'm, I'm a Florida resident. You know, I, I love our governor. I think he is terrific. I think he's done an excellent job as governor. The media made an enormous mistake in deciding to draw a hero-villain dichotomy between Andrew Cuomo and Ron DeSantis. 
because that thing has been flipped entirely on its head at this point for a variety of reasons. Uh, Ron DeSantis has done an excellent job down here. He is pugnacious in the way that Trump is pugnacious. Uh, he is also a policy wonk. Like, he actually knows the facts. He knows things, which is impressive. I mean, I've had conversations with him. This is a guy who actually studies the, the statistics and the science. He's a very smart dude. He went to Harvard Law School. Like, he, he's, a, he's a bright guy. And, um, and I think that he, his leadership in Florida has been excellent. I think he's an excellent candidate. By the way, he's going to win going away. His gubernatorial race, which comes up, it comes up later this year, he's going to win that race hands down. I mean, the Democratic Governors Association pulled out of the state, basically. Remember, when Ron DeSantis won a few years ago, he beat Andrew Gillum by something like 30,000 votes out of several million votes cast. And this time around, the, the, the massive shift in the nature of the state of Florida is, is truly amazing. If you go back about eight years the beginning of the, to the middle of the, the Obama administration, there are something like half a million more Democrats than Republicans in the state of Florida. Now there are more registered Republicans than Democrats in the state of Florida. That's an amazing thing. Listen, I could not be higher on Ron DeSantis. Now, if Trump runs, no one's running. Okay, that's the simple fact of it. If Trump gets in, no one else is getting in. And the reason no one else is getting in is because Donald Trump does not have the power to create. He only has the power to destroy. And he will just wreck anyone who gets into a ring with him. Even if that person beats him in a primary, he will then spend the rest of the primaries complaining that the election was stolen, that the person who faced him down is corrupt and terrible and has small hands. And that person is going to go wounded into a general. Everyone knows this, right? which is why Trump is still the kingmaker and still the guy who gets to choose what, what happens from here on out. Some of the other candidates who are out there, listen, I, I know uh, former Ambassador Haley. I love Ambassador Haley. I think that she's great. Uh, I don't think that she stacks up well against DeSantis just politically uh, because, again, her, her greatest claim to fame, she was governor of South Carolina, but that was a while ago. Then she was ambassador under Trump, and then she got kind of crossways with Trump, which is always sort of a, a mistake politically speaking uh, at this moment. Uh, so I think that, that that's not, this isn't her moment. Uh, I'll put it that way. Some other candidates who, who sort of have cropped up recently, people have talked about Tom Cotton from Arkansas. I think Senator Cotton is excellent. Uh, people have talked about Governor Greg Abbott from, from Texas. Uh, I think that he is, a, he is a good and interesting candidate. He's been a good governor over there. Um, it, it's, there's a list. Tim Scott from South Carolina, the senator. I think that most people have talked about him for Veep as opposed to for, for president, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see him run. Uh, so the, the Republicans, unlike the Democrats, I think, have a slightly deeper bench. Now, some Republicans are concerned that if they re elect a president, uh, that they might run on a sort of Trumpite platform, but then simply reverse back to mainstream sort of uh, Bush era Republicanism. Is there any Republicans who you think shouldn't run other than Donald Trump? Uh, well, I mean, anyone in the Bush family, right? you're not going to see Jeb run again. Uh, I, I think that you, you might see a, a foolhardy run from a Liz Cheney type, you know, somebody who thinks that just yelling about January 6th a lot is going to somehow win them Republican primary votes. And I think that's unlikely to, to work. Um, yes, you know, some of the, I'm trying to think who, who else has sort of been on the list. You know, Vice President Pence has been on the list before, but I think that Trump has damaged him pretty significantly with all of the January 6th complaining. And I, I think that Trump could not hold back against Pence, which is really to Trump's discredit, frankly, because I think Vice President Pence is a very honorable human being. Uh, and I think that he would make a good president. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's sort of the list. So my final question is a sort of a running theme for this interview. Despite the fact we've been very pessimistic in some ways, I want you to give some reasons to conservatives all around the world, particularly in America, why they should be optimistic for the future. You should be optimistic because on the core issues that matter, you are in the majority, not the minority. I know it feels like you're in the minority. It felt like I was in the minority when I was in California too, because I was. When it comes to the key issues, you know, the things that you're not allowed to say online, things like you know, crime is bad and riots are bad and you deserve to keep most of the money that you make. And men are men and women are women and you should not ch teach children that men can be women and women can be men. You should not generally mutilate children. <laughs> like these are all very obvious things that you have been told by the elites in your society you are not supposed to say. Guess what? 80% of people agree with you. And when, you, when they all wake up and they realize that they agree with you, then there is going to be pushback like nobody's business. I think that's the story of the next several years. Ben Shapiro, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.